According to the Book of Mormon, who is the keeper at Heaven's Gate? Peter? Christ? Or Joseph Smith? Are there references in the Book of Mormon to Masonic symbols used in the LDS Temple architecture? Is the term Christ mentioned in the Old Testament era of the Book of Mormon an anachronism? All these questions and more answered in this episode. Hi, Max here. Welcome to the Come Follow Me podcast. This review covers the lesson plan for 2 Nephi chapters 6 through 10. Make sure to subscribe to be notified of our upcoming videos. For more, you can find this podcast on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. For the sake of time, I will not cite all the parallel phrases and words from the Old and New Testaments that are in the Book of Mormon text. For a complete transcript of this lesson, please click on the link in the description below. Our Come Follow Me manual states as an introduction to this lesson, quote, It has been at least 40 years since Lehi's family left Jerusalem. They were in a strange new land, half a world away from Jerusalem and the rest of God's covenant people. Lehi had died, and his prosperity had already started what would become a century-long contention between the Nephites, quote, who believed in the warnings and revelations of God, end quote, and the Lamanites who did not, 2 Nephi 5.6. In these circumstances, Jacob, who was Nephi's younger brother and now ordained as a teacher for the Nephites, wanted the covenant people to know that God would never forget them, so they must never forget him. End quote. Now Nephi records some teachings of his younger brother, Jacob, as Jacob teaches his people. He, like Nephi, turns to the words of Isaiah, and Jacob basically quotes the same portions of Isaiah that Nephi did in 1 Nephi 20-21, through as he now reads Isaiah 49, 22-60. through 2 Nephi 6-3, the phrase, quote, things which are written, is the same in Revelation 22, 19. 2 Nephi 6, 5. Jacob taught his people that the teachings of Isaiah, quote, may be likened unto you, end quote, meaning the reader will find application. 2 Nephi 6, 6 through 7. These verses, in almost their entirety, are from Isaiah 49, verses 22 through 23. 2 Nephi 6, 8. Jacob says, for behold, the Lord has shown me that those who were at Jerusalem from whence we came have been slain and carried away captive. Second Nephi 6, 9 Nevertheless, the Lord has shown unto me that they should return again. And he also has shown unto me that the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, should manifest himself unto them in the flesh. And after he should manifest himself, they should scourge him and crucify him, according to the words of the angel who spake it unto me. The phrase, quote, the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, is also in Isaiah 30, 15, and, quote, they should scourge him, is similar to Luke 18, 33. Second Nephi 6, 10, Jacob says, because of what the Jews did to Christ, they would be afflicted, scattered, smitten, and hated. This happened in 70 AD, when the Roman army invaded and destroyed Jerusalem. 2 Nephi 6.11, the phrase, quote, driven to and fro, is also in Job 13.25, and, quote, come to the knowledge of, end quote, is the same in 2 Timothy 3.7. 2 Nephi 6.12, the Gentiles, who are the non-Jews, will be blessed. 2 Nephi 6.13, the phrase, quote, lick up the dust of their feet, is similar to Isaiah 49.23. Second Nephi 6.14 Jacob then explains that Isaiah spoke of the eventual return of the Jews to their homelands. The phrase, quote, again the second time to recover, is also in Isaiah 11.11. 11. And, quote, power and great glory is the same in Matthew 24.30. In Second Nephi 6.15, the signs of the time are mentioned. 2 Nephi 6, 16-18 The Lord will fight their battles and deliver His covenant people. These three verses are almost identical to Isaiah 49, 24-26. Jacob quotes in chapter 7 what is basically known as Isaiah 50 in the Bible, and from chapter 8 what is Isaiah 51 in the Bible. I will let you read and consider those two chapters on your own. However, I need to point out that 2 Nephi 7, 5 is a correction from the original Book of Mormon, since the 1964 edition 
it now says in part, quote, The Lord God hath opened my ear, end quote. But in the 1830 edition, it reads, quote, The Lord God hath appointed my ear, end quote. So it changed from appointed to opened. Now, after quoting Isaiah, Jacob, in 2 Nephi 9, is going to explain these chapters to his people. 2 Nephi 9, 1, the phrase, quote, The covenants of the Lord that he has covenanted with all the house of Israel, end quote, is similar to 2 Chronicles 6, 11. 2 Nephi 9, 2, Jacob tells his people that the Jews will be gathered in all their lands of promise to be restored to the true church and fold of God, referring to Mormonism. The phrase, quote, by the mouth of his holy prophets, even from the beginning, end quote, is similar to Luke 170. This was written around 550 BC and predicted a restoration of the true church, centuries before Christ was even born and able to establish it in the first place. Jacob teaches that the resurrected Lord will appear to those in Jerusalem. Jacob now builds a case for his people as to why they need the atonement. 2 Nephi 9.6 he teaches that without death, we could not be resurrected. Adam brought death, Christ brought life. And because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. The phrase, quote, death hath passed upon all men, is similar to Romans 5.12. And, quote, by reason of transgression, is also in Daniel 8.12. 2 Nephi 9.7. Wherefore, it must needs be an infinite atonement, Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. As you know, the atonement made it possible for mankind to overcome two types of death, physical death and spiritual death. At this point, Jacob is emphasizing what would happen if Christ had not overcome physical death for us. 2 Nephi 9.8 Jacob says that if there was no resurrection, then our spirits would become subject to the devil. 2 Nephi 9.9 and our spirits must have become like unto him, and we become devils, angels to a devil, to be shut out from the presence of our God, and to remain with the father of lies in misery like unto himself. Second Nephi 9, 10-11 Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. And because of the way of deliverance of our God, the Holy One of Israel, this death of which I have spoken, which is the temporal, shall deliver up its dead, which death is the grave. Jacob goes on, 2 Nephi 9.12. And this death of which I have spoken, which is the spiritual death, shall deliver up its dead, which spiritual death is hell. Wherefore death and hell must deliver up their dead, and hell must deliver up its captive spirits, and the grave must deliver up its captive bodies, and the bodies and the spirits of men will be restored one to the other, and it is by the power of the resurrection of the Holy One of Israel. Second Nephi 9.13 mentions, quote, the paradise of God, same as in Revelation 2.7. Second Nephi 9.14, Jacob then emphasizes the differences between the wicked and the righteous at judgment day. The phrase, quote, have a perfect knowledge of, is similar to Acts 24, 22. And, quote, with the robe of righteousness, is the same in Isaiah 61, 10. Second Nephi 9, 15. All men and women will be accountable before the Holy One of Israel. The phrase, quote, must appear before the judgment seat, is similar to 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Second Nephi 9, 16. Jacob teaches, and assuredly as the Lord liveth, for the Lord God hath spoken it, and it is his eternal word which cannot pass away. This verse says that God's word cannot pass away. The Book of Mormon teaches on the one hand, plain and precious truths were taken away. See 1 Nephi 13, 38-40. But here it says God's word cannot pass away. In fact, both teachings that contradict each other are found here in the books of First and Second Nephi. So which one is true? By consulting the Bible, we find Jesus himself promising in Luke 21, 33, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Second Nephi 9, 16. 
Now considering all these many New Testament phrases in just one verse, quote, word which cannot pass away, similar to Matthew 24, 35, and, quote, they who are righteous shall be righteous still, and they who are filthy shall be filthy still, end quote, is similar to Revelation 22, 11, quote, the devil and his angels, and they shall go away into everlasting fire prepared for them, end quote, similar to Matthew 25, 41. Quote, lake of fire and brimstone, end quote, same as in Revelation 20, 10, and, quote, ascendeth up forever and ever, end quote, same as in Revelation 14, 11. New Testament phraseology everywhere. Now Jacob emphasizes the joy and status of the righteous eternally. 2 Nephi 9.18 But behold, the righteous, the saints of the Holy One of Israel, they who have believed in the Holy One of Israel, they who have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it, they shall inherit the kingdom of God which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and their joy shall be full forever. 2 Nephi 9.19 The phrase is, quote, Mercy of God, end quote, is also in Luke 178, and, quote, Lake of Fire and Brimstone is the same in Revelation 20:10. 20, 2 Nephi 9:20, Jacob says, O oh, how great the holiness of our God! For he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. In other words, he is omniscient. A common question that comes up is whether or not Christ paid for the sins of all people, meaning the entire world or only for those who repent of all their sins? Jacob answers it in this next verse. 2 Nephi 9.21 And he cometh into the world that he may save all men, if they will hearken unto his voice. For behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children who belong to the family of Adam. In other words, Christ paid for all sins, whether repented of or not. According to LDS scripture, how much did he suffer? See DNC 18.10-14 and DNC 19.16-18. The phrase is, quote, cometh into the world, is the same in John 1.9, and, quote, of every living creature, is also in Leviticus 11.46. Second Nephi 9.23. And he commandeth all men that they must repent, and be baptized in his name, having perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel, or they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. Second Nephi 9.24 And if they will not repent and believe in his name, and be baptized in his name, and endure to the end, they must be damned. For the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has spoken it. The first half of this verse you will recognize is similar to Mark 16.16. 16. This verse speaks of being baptized in his name. Baptism doesn't show up in the Bible until we read about John the Baptist in the New Testament. Baptism is absent in the Jewish canon or Old Testament Septuagint, yet it is mentioned 58 times in the Old Testament era of the Book of Mormon, which is anachronistic. To the Latter-day Saint, to be damned means to be stopped from eternal progression in the celestial kingdom. Those who are damned will inherit one of the lesser kingdoms or glories. 2 Nephi 9, 25-27 Jacob teaches that God is completely fair and that a person who has not been taught about God's laws and commandments is not accountable for those laws. Mormonism teaches from Doctrine and Covenants 138 that everyone who did not get an opportunity to learn and accept the gospel in this life will get the opportunity in the spirit world. But for those who have heard the Mormon gospel and don't live it, awful is his state. 2 Nephi 9, 27 and 30 through 38. In these verses, Jacob gives his 10 woes that basically function as the equivalent Nephite 10 commandments. Not formulated as thou shalt not, but as woe unto. Jacob pronounces a woe or curse upon those who do not keep the commandments. 2 Nephi 9.28 Oh, that cunning plan of the evil one! Oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men! When they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. 
Second Nephi 9, 29. But to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. In D&C 88, 118, Latter-day Saints are commanded to seek wisdom and learning. Second Nephi 9, 30, the phrase, quote, But woe unto the rich, is similar to Luke 6, 24, and, quote, The things of the world, is also in 1 Corinthians 7, 34, and, quote, Their treasure shall perish with them, similar to Acts 8.20. Jacob now teaches about the fate of those who waste their mortal lives in wicked living. 2 Nephi 9.34 Liars, quote, shall be thrust down to hell, is the same in Luke 10.15. But, according to D&C 63.17-18 and D&C 76.103-106, the unrepentant liar will inherit the telestial kingdom. Then Jacob says in 2 Nephi 9.38, And in fine, woe unto all those who die in their sins, for they shall return to God and behold his face and remain in their sins. The phrase, quote, die in their sins, is similar to John 8.21. 2 Nephi 9.39 Remember, to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. That phrase is almost the same as in Romans 8.6. I wonder what Paul would have thought had he known his very words would be inserted into a book written nearly 600 years earlier on the other side of the world. Jacob now invites his people to be loyal to Christ and to remember that his paths are righteous. Second Nephi 9.41, speaking of heaven, Jacob says, And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. I guess this disproves the popular folklore that St. Peter will meet us at the pearly gates of heaven. See Revelation 21.21. 21. I do wonder about Jacob's statement that only Christ and no other servant will be there to allow souls to enter heaven. Brigham Young, in Journal of Discourses, Volume 7, page 289, said, quote, No man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. Every man and woman must have a certificate of Joseph Smith Jr. as a passport to their entrance. I cannot go without his consent. He reigns there as supreme a being in his sphere, capacity, and calling as God does in heaven. End quote. While the Latter-day Saints certainly don't worship Joseph Smith, there seems to be evidence that the church authorities wanted to elevate him almost to the same level as Jesus Christ. Consider another statement from Brigham Young in Journal of Discourses, Volume 14, page 203. Quote, well, now examine the character of the Savior, and examine the character of those who have written in the Old and New Testaments, and then compare with the character of Joseph Smith, the founder of this work. And you will find that his character stands as fair as that of any man's mentioned in the Bible. We can find no person who presents a better character to the world than the facts that are known than Joseph Smith Jr., the prophet, and his brother Hiram Smith, who was murdered with him. End quote. Next, Jacob reminds his people that in their final judgment before God, the wicked will have a perfect recollection of their sins. As far as the righteous are concerned, they can take comfort knowing that the sins which they have repented of will not even be mentioned on Judgment Day. 2 Nephi 9.44 This passage has a parallel to the modern-day LDS temples. O my beloved brethren, remember my words. Behold, I take off my garments and I shake them before you, I pray the God of my salvation that he view me with his all-searching eye. The all-searching eye, or the all-seeing eye of God, is represented in the architecture of the Nauvoo Temple and the Salt Lake Temple. History of the Church by Joseph Smith, Volume 4, page 550-551, to records Joseph Smith's induction into the Masonic Lodge in 1842. Quote, Tuesday, 15th. I officiated as Grand Chaplain at the installation of the Nauvoo Lodge of Freemasons at the grove near the temple. Grand Master Jonas of Columbus, being present, a large number of people assembled on the occasion. The day was exceedingly fine, 
all things were done in order, and universal satisfaction was manifested. In the evening, I received the first degree in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge, assembled in my general business office. End quote. The next day, Smith recorded in History of the Church, Volume 4, page 552, quote, Wednesday, March 16th, I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. End quote. Mormon involvement in Freemasonry grew rapidly. In the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, Volume 2, page 527, it reads, quote, The introduction of Freemasonry in Nauvoo had both political and religious implications. Eventually, nearly 1,500 LDS men became associated with Illinois' Freemasonry, including many members of the church's governing priesthood bodies. This at a time when the total number of non-LDS Masons in Illinois' lodge barely reached 150. End quote. The Mormon endowment ceremony introduced by Joseph Smith was inspired by the Masonic Lodge ceremony. It was also obvious that the Nauvoo Temple architecture and later Salt Lake Temple was influenced by Masonry with the use of Masonic symbols and shapes. Along with sunstones, moons and star stones, cloud stones, aprons, beehives, compass, square, and hand grip was the all-seeing eye. Other Book of Mormon references to the all-seeing eye include Jacob 2.10, quote, under the glance of the piercing eye of the Almighty God, end quote, and Mosiah 27.31, quote, the glance of his all-searching eye, end quote. Then Jacob pleads in 2 Nephi 9.45, O my beloved brethren, turn away from your sins. Shake off the chains of him that would bind you fast. Come unto that God who is the rock of your salvation. 2 Nephi 9.46, the phrase, quote, the day of judgment is the same in Matthew 10.15. Quote, holy, holy are thy judgments, O Lord God Almighty, is similar to Revelation 4.8. And, quote, freed from sin is the same in Romans 6.7. 2 Nephi 9, 50-51 is almost a direct quote of Isaiah 55, 1-2. Jacob wraps up 2 Nephi chapter 9 by giving a prophecy of the restoration through Joseph Smith and the conversion of the Lamanites in the last days. Verse 53. And behold how great the covenants of the Lord, and how great his condescensions unto the children of men. And because of his greatness, and his grace and mercy, he has promised unto us that our seed shall not utterly be destroyed according to the flesh, but that he would preserve them, and in future generations they shall become a righteous branch unto the house of Israel. Second Nephi 10.2 Jacob predicted that many Nephite descendants would perish in the flesh because of unbelief. Nevertheless, God will be merciful unto many, and our children shall be restored, that they may come to that which will give them the true knowledge of their Redeemer. The phrase, quote, because of unbelief, is the same in Romans 11.20. And now, Jacob will disclose for the first time to his people the name of the Redeemer. 2 Nephi 10.3 Wherefore, as I said unto you, it must needs be expedient that Christ, for in the last night the angel spake unto me that this should be his name, should come among the Jews, among those who are the more wicked part of the world. And they shall crucify him, for thus it behooveth our God. And there is none other nation on earth that would crucify their God. An angel revealed that Christ should be his name. And the angel does that 550 years before Jesus was born. If you remember in a previous lesson, we covered an important change in the Book of Mormon regarding 1 Nephi 1218. Here it is. Once again, the original 1830 edition of 1 Nephi 1218 reads, quote, Yea, even the word of justice of the eternal God, and Jesus Christ, which is the Lamb of God, end quote. The problem is that the name Jesus Christ was not revealed to the Nephites until 50 years later, here in 2 Nephi 10.3, which reads, quote, Wherefore, as said unto you, it must needs be expedient that Christ for in the last night the angel spake unto me that this should be his name, should come among the Jews. End quote. In order to correct this contradiction, 1 Nephi 12.18 was changed in the later editions of the Book of Mormon to read Messiah instead of Jesus Christ. 
The word Christ was an English term created long after the Savior lived. The word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is a title meaning anointed one. Lehi and his families were supposedly Jews, and Jews were, and remain today, singularly monotheistic. That is why the Jews in the Holy Land rejected Jesus when he claimed to be the Son of God. And because they determined it to be blasphemy, they ended up killing him. Jacob goes on to say in 2 Nephi 10.6 about the Jews who crucified Christ. Wherefore, because of their iniquities, destructions, famines, pestilences, and bloodshed shall come upon them, and they who shall not be destroyed shall be scattered among all nations. The phrase, quote, which shall not be destroyed, is in Daniel 6.26. Then he explains that the Jews will eventually believe in Christ and will be gathered to the lands of their inheritance. This began in 1948 with the creation of Israel as a nation. Then, speaking of America, Jacob says in 2 Nephi 10.11-13, And this land shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and there shall be no kings upon the land who shall raise up unto the Gentiles. And I will fortify this land against all other nations, and he that fighteth against Zion shall perish, saith God. Next is a warning to all people that no one will successfully fight against Zion, meaning the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 2 Nephi 10.16 Wherefore he that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, both male and female, shall perish. For they are they who are the whore of all the earth. For they who are not for me are against me, saith our God. 2 Nephi 10.19 Wherefore I will consecrate this land unto thy seed, and them who shall be numbered among thy seed forever, for the land of their inheritance. For it is a choice land, saith God unto me, above all other lands. Wherefore I will have all men that dwell thereon, that they shall worship me, saith God. Next, Jacob tries to be encouraging by saying in 2 Nephi 10.23, Therefore, cheer up your hearts, and remember that ye are free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death, or the way of eternal life. When he says everlasting death, he means spiritual death, the second death. In Mormonism, it means being cut off from being in the presence of God forever. In other words, not making it into the celestial kingdom. Eternal life in Mormonism means exaltation in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. It means living in the family unit, becoming gods, living plural marriage, having billions of spirit children, and creating worlds for them to live on. According to the 1916 First Presidency Statement, in the Improvement Era, August 1916, quote, Only resurrected and glorified beings can become parents of spirit offspring. Only such exalted souls have reached maturity in the appointed course of eternal life. And the spirits born to them in the eternal worlds will pass in due sequence through the several stages or estates by which the glorified parents have attained exaltation. End quote. Second Nephi 10.24 The phrase, quote, Through the grace of God that ye are saved is similar to Acts 15.11. Jacob ends his teaching with 2 Nephi 10.25. Wherefore may God raise you from death by the power of the resurrection, and also from everlasting death by the power of the atonement, that ye may be received into the eternal kingdom of God, that ye may praise him through grace divine. Amen. The phrase, quote, the atonement that ye may, is also in 2 Samuel 21.3. And that concludes our lesson for today. Please subscribe so you won't miss any of our future episodes. For more, you can find this podcast on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. You can also find us on Facebook and share this with your friends. Or you can go to our website at talkingtomormons.com where you can download the script and learn much more. Until next time, God bless.